Colleagues and friends, welcome. Good evening. My name's John Williams. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor of Research Operation and the Dean of Graduate Studies. I'd first like to acknowledge the Ghana people, the original custodians of the Adelaide Plains upon which the three campuses of the University at North Terrace, Waite, Theberton and Roseworthy are built. And I'm delighted to welcome you all and everybody who's watching on the live stream on Facebook to this three minute thesis event. Now the three minute thesis event is a national competition which, uh, but it's an important and it's become an important annual event on the Adelaide University calendar and part of our Research Tuesday series. The concept was developed at the University of Queensland back in 2008 and since then it has been adopted by over 600 universities across 59 countries. The ability to effectively communicate research impact is a skill that our researchers must develop and the three minute thesis competition is a wonderful chance for our research students to develop those skills. And for us, the audience, it's just a great chance to see the stars of the future. Dozens of student researchers from each faculty has vied for the 10 places here tonight. This is the next generation of uh, leading research stars. The winner of the competition will compete in the Asia Pacific finals held later this month at the University of Queensland. But before I begin, I'd like to invite the Vice Chancellor, Professor Mike Brooks, to say a few words. Professor Brooks. Thanks, thanks very much, John, uh, and uh, great to see everyone here. Can I also acknowledge the Ghana people, the original custodians of the land upon which we meet? Uh, welcome. Uh, great to see you all here at this very exciting event. Uh, this is held under the auspices of Research Tuesdays. Research Tuesdays is the university's monthly forum whereby researchers present their wares and uh, discuss developments, exciting developments, uh, with, uh, with the public. Uh, a very important uh, function for the University of Adelaide. Tonight, Research Tuesdays, it's turned over to the three-minute thesis, as John said, and uh, this has indeed become a worldwide phenomenon. I was in, uh, uh, I just happened to be a few days ago in Imperial College in London and uh, saw a poster on the wall inviting students to participate in uh, Imperial College's tournament. So uh, it's, uh, it's a wonderful worldwide competition. And it's, a, of course, a challenge in communication and a challenge in brevity, and we look forward very much to hearing from our contestants this evening. There will be ten of them, two from each of the five faculties of the University of Adelaide. Now, I spoke to our contestants, our extremely talented contestants, and asked them if they were nervous, and uh, a few of them put their hands up in answer to that. But I told them we have an extremely friendly audience here tonight. And so when they, uh, when they come on and speak, just before they come on up, I'm hoping you'll smile and uh, make them very welcome. Kind of like this. <laughs> yeah. Actually, my daughters told me that's very scary. <laughs> um, <laughs> I also told our contestants that uh, everyone really is a winner just being here. To be shortlisted at this uh, competition, they're already a winner and they can be very proud. So just relax and enjoy yourself. Easier said than done, I know, but uh, give it a go. Um, just a quick word before I finish that, uh, about PhD students in the life of a, a research-intensive university. Uh, many of you, I know, will be uh, connected or part of uh, uh, the research life. And we all know that if you want a really successful, strong, international, collaborative, eminent research group, you need lots of great PhD students. We have wonderful talent in the state, and the University of Adelaide is blessed with great PhD students. Uh, we graduate uh, well over 400 uh, PhD and Masters by Research students a year in the university, under uh, John's responsibility, I might say. Um, but PhD students are not only important to a university in, in that we provide research training and, uh, and send amazing people out into the world, they're really part of the engine room of discovery. They do amazing things. They're, they're a genuine part of 
uh, knowledge development, knowledge acquisition, and discovery. Uh, no university in the world would be research eminent uh, to the extent that it is without lots of great PhD students. So you're very important, you guys, OK? You already knew it, I know. So um, I wish our participants the very best of luck. Uh, I know you'll be very supportive. And uh, just have fun and look forward to hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. So now, before we begin, let's have a look at the competition rules uh, and the judging criteria that will be, and then I'll introduce the judges. So there are some very simple yet very challenging rules which you can see before you. Uh, there has to be a static PowerPoint slide, no slide transition. There can be no electronic media, sounds or files. Now, as a lawyer, I know that once the list starts to have a lot of no's in it, somebody tried it. And that's why we've got it. So no rap music, no poems, no songs. Uh, I think you get the thing. It's really stand and deliver. So looking at the judging criteria, and these are ones to keep in your mind as we're, as we're going to be asking you to vote. So the judging criteria, it has to be comprehensive and, and its content. So it goes to the presentation that was provided, the background of the research. What's the question they're trying to answer? Did the speaker avoid the jargon? Did it get to you as a as a lay person in this area. Looking at the engagement and the communication, did the oration make sense and want the audience to want more? Did the presenter convey the enthusiasm of their research? So they're the criteria which we need you all to think about when you cast your survey um, tonight. Now let's introduce our judging panel. So we have a distinguished group. Uh, I, I might just ask them to, it's probably hard for them to stand, but I might ask them to signal to us. So Julia Grant, if you could just uh, there. Julia is the Executive Director of the Climate Change at the De Department of the Environment, Water and Natural Resources. She's had more than 17 years of policy, public policy uh, development, has a wealth of experience in the policy challenges of water and the climate change portfolios. She was a policy advisor to the former Premier, Mike Rand, for five and a half years and facilitated the passage of Australia's first climate change legislation here in South Australia. She then moved to the Department of Premier and Cabinet and had responsibility for negotiating and implementing over 20 agreements with industry and local government to address climate change and the challenges therewith. She's currently responsible for leading the development of government policy solutions in a low carbon state future and leads the government's implementation of our climate change strategy. Please welcome Julia Grant. And now we have two, two members of the fourth estate. The first is David Washington. David? David Washington, as many would know, is the editor of In Daily. And he also writes on a diverse range of topics from politics, football, science, agriculture. And he began his career nearly 30 years ago don't look a day over at, with the advertiser. And he's been a reporter in federal politics, food, public servant. He's been a state government media advisor. And he was, uh, I'm assured, the press officer for the vice chancellor between 1995 and 2001, David Washington. <laughs> Simon Royal. Simon Royal. Uh, Simon's had a diverse career of the ABC to date including a morning presenter and regional radio at Port Pirie. He's been a state TV, a state politics reporter. He's been on radio. He's been overnight. I never heard you overnight on radio. Uh, he's been on the 7.30 report. He's been in Queensland. He's been a TV news reader. Uh, Simon has a BA in communication studies from another institution. Uh, and, <laughs> and he has a passion, as I know, for US politics. He studied Italian. He tells me he speaks it appallingly, though thankfully infrequently. Uh, and he endures Irish terriers. Simon Roy. <laughs> uh, professor Julie Owens is the professor and, and acting deputy vice chancellor. Uh, Julie is internationally recognised as for her research in pregnancy and fetal growth and development. Uh, one of our research stars. She has initiated many local, national, and international strategic links in the health and medical science area. And during her time as the head of uh, one of our major schools, 
It received a five rate ranking in the ERA in 2010 and 2012, the only one in the country to do so. She deeply understands research strategy and uh, she has a prodigious output in her research. Julie Owens, Professor Julie Owens. <laughs> and last but not least, we have Professor Noel Lindsay. Noel. Now, Noel has a, a, a CV that could go on, but let me just say Noel is the Pro Vice Chancellor of Entrepreneurship and the Director of our Entrepreneurship Commercialisation Innovation Centre at the University. He's held positions in Academic Director in Singapore. He's been the Head of the Marketing and Managing uh, School. He's also an Associate uh, Dean of Diversity and Inclusion at the University. Um, he has been involved in the key element of our strategy in the entrepreneurial area in the University. Professor Noel Lindsay. <laughs> the judging panel will choose one winner to carry out, to take our, our to university to the three minute thesis final in Queensland. The winner will receive $2,000 travel grant plus free travel and accommodation at the, at the national finals. So let me explain the people's choice. Tonight you would have given the opportunity to choose that winner. You have your voting uh, a vote for the People's Choice Award. On arrival, you should have been given a form, which you have. If you don't, please put your hand up and we'll get you another. Please save it till later and we will provide you information about how and when to vote. As I said, the winner of the People's Choice will receive a $1,000 travel grant. Uh, and I said, if you don't have a form, we'll find you one. Uh, we also have, and this is tonight, the inaugural uh, special announcement. We have the inaugural Student's Choice. And the group that we have, the first of this is only high school students. So only high school, put your hands up. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> so please welcome. Again, you've all, you know the system, you've been given a, a form. Please wait to the end and fill it in. Uh, and uh, not quite as prestigious as the People's Choice in terms of funds, but equally in standing, $250 voucher. So thank you very much. House rules, a mobile phones, off or on silent, please. Stay seated until the presenter has completed their three-minute uh, presentation. No flash photography. Uh, the facilities are out the back, and if there's an earthquake, just go under the seat. Um, <laughs> so now, let's get started. I will introduce each finalist. They will be given three-minute presentation, after which the judges will ask a question and seek some feedback, and so on. After the final presentation, the judges will step away for 10 to 15 minutes to deliberate and the audience will complete their voting papers and hand them in. And finally, I invite the finalists to come to the forward, uh, to forward and we'll make the announcement. I will introduce each finalist for, and their faculty. Please hold your applause until the conclusion of each of their presentations. So off we go. Our first presenter is Daniel Shamsnamit, sorry, from Engineering, Computer Science and Mathematics. Danielle. Can you imagine your life anymore without your smartphone? Or even computers? Or taking a step further out, electricity? This would be our life without the metal copper. Copper is one of the most versatile and widely used metals of modern society. Its unique properties makes it indispensable in almost anything having to do with electricity, all the way from your handheld gadgets to wind turbines and solar panels. Ooh. <laughs> um, and with this technology increasing every day, so will the demand for copper. This is good news for Australia. Australia has the second most known amount of copper in the entire world. However, most of this copper is still in the ground and trapped in the rocks. Now these rocks are incredibly fascinating, yet also incredibly complex. Part of this complexity is the fact that some of the rocks that have a lot of copper also have uranium. Uranium on its own wouldn't be a big deal, but the thing that makes uranium special is its ability to radioactively decay. And I know this can be a touchy topic, so before anyone jumps out of their seats, remember a banana is radioactive, and it is actually more active than the copper I work with. And, scientifically speaking, radioactive decay is an incredible natural phenomenon where one particle will completely change its chemical and physical properties to create a totally new particle. And that particle subsequently changes and on and on. 
So from starting with just one element, uranium, we now have a bunch of different particles all acting independently of each other. Scientifically, that's awesome. But in application, that's kind of a big mess. Most of these particles are not very well understood, and some of them only last a few seconds. And this is the knowledge gap that my research is filling. And specifically, how these decay particles will act and react in rocks and minerals through geologic time so that we can predict where they are in the rocks being mined today. Because what's happening is that we don't know where they are, and so some of them are able to tag along with copper all the way through processing and ending up in the copper concentrate. And this is a very undesirable contaminant to have when selling on the global market. My research predicts the location of these decay particles in the minerals before entering processing, so that in processing they can be targeted specifically and efficiently extracted, therefore ensuring the production of clean copper. With rapid modernization happening across the globe, the demand for copper is expected to outstrip supply in just three years. My research is essential to keep Australia as a major player in this global copper economy for generations to come. Thank you. Fantastic. Great start. To our judges. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Can you, can you tell us something about the mechanism you've used to predict where these, uh, where these particles are? Yep. Um, so we look at really high um, detail elemental components of different minerals um, to try and find any clues that would lead us to think that the decay chain or the decay path were happening in that mineral um, in time. So by being able to identify, so these happen in very, very small concentrations. So if you can find the beginning of the chain and the end of the chain, then you can assume that there is also the middle of the chain in those minerals. So by identifying that in the mineral, you can predict um, exactly how much of those decay particles would be in the minerals. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks. Well done. We're often racing people. Our second presenter, Lauren White, from the Faculty of Health and Medical Science. Imagine it's Sunday afternoon. You've taken your dog for a walk. You've walked your dog on the same path every Sunday afternoon for the past five years. But today, something is different. You've stopped on a corner. You're not sure where to go next. You can't remember which way home is. You're confused. This should be simple. This is how it started for the more than 400,000 Australians currently living with dementia. Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia, but we currently have no treatments that stop or even slow its progression. So what do we know? We know that there are two key proteins that build up in the Alzheimer's brain, amyloid beta and tau. Both of these proteins are normally broken down in brain cells in a compartment called the lysosome, the cell's garbage disposal and recycling unit. We know that the lysosome looks a little different in the Alzheimer's brain than it does in normal brains, and we think it could hold some clues as to how and why Alzheimer's disease develops. I am characterising the function of the lysosome in a new Alzheimer's mouse. I have shown that some of the key proteins that the lysosome needs to do its job look a little different in this mouse. I've also shown that these lysosomal proteins build up around the amyloid beta in the brains of these mice. So something's going on with the lysosome. And this has led to my next question. What happens when there's a genetic problem with the lysosome? There are a number of severe childhood diseases that affect brain function that arise when a child inherits two copies of a mutation in a gene that is required for the lysosome to work. This occurs when a child inherits the mutation from both their mum and their dad. But what happens when someone inherits just one copy of the mutation and has one normal copy of the gene? They appear healthy in childhood. But what happens when they get older? We know that their lysosomes aren't working at 100%, and we now know that this is similar to what occurs during Alzheimer's disease. So I'm asking whether these types of mutations 
might make it more likely for a person to develop Alzheimer's disease. Finding risk factors like this is critical because we know that if we want to treat Alzheimer's disease, we need to catch it early. We need to know about it before you forget your way home on your Sunday walk. And to do this, we need some clues on who we're looking for. I think that genetics and the lysosome might just hold these answers. Congratulations on using a dog to start with. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you win. <laughs> How far are we away from a cure, in your view, or at least a um, suite of reasonable and effective treatments? And what role will your work play in that? I don't think we're too far away. Um, I think a full-blown cure for someone who's already lost their memory, we might be a little further away. But I think if we can start to treat people um, really early on, I think we're quite close to doing that. Um, and I hope that my work will play a role in that. I think um, one of the things that is holding us back a little bit is knowing um, exactly what's causing the proteins um, that build up to do so. And I think that work like mine um, and work that other people are doing might help with that. So I think that will help to bring the treatment sooner. Our third contestant, Charles Klein, Art. We learn to sing before we can talk. In this moment pictured here, my daughter breathed air into her lungs for the first time. And she exhaled that air, pushing it past the vocal cords and they vibrated. Her vocal cords vibrated in just the same way as the two pieces of cane that form the reed at the top of my oboe. My journey with the oboe started with a sound. And when I went on to learn to control, articulate, and master this sound, I learned that you put this finger down and it becomes a B natural. You add that finger, it becomes a C-sharp. Put all of the fingers down, roll the index, and it becomes a D up the octave. It becomes complicated. And it's a long journey from there to technical mastery of the instrument. There are many opportunities along the way to demonstrate your level of technical ability. But it is so easy to forget about the music amidst all of this technical stuff. For a musical audience, it is long flowing lines and singing musical phrases that speak to you, that tell you stories. There is very little repertoire, solo repertoire for the modern oboe. My research addresses this problem by generating new solo works for the instrument. I do this by translating songs originally written for vocalists to the instrument, by selecting some of the most powerful vocal repertoire, including their exercises, the ones which revolutionise the teaching and learning of singing. I ask, what can the oboe learn from these exercises? By inviting Australian composers to revisit these exercises, they become works in their own right. And then, most importantly, I am employing innovative, performance-based research methods. In this case, performance is the lab test with which to evaluate audience reaction. Are the connections being made? Is the story being told? This forms the litmus test for the success of my own musical expression. I am harnessing the power and beauty of song, the eloquence of song, seeking to marry the, the beauty of song. Thank you very much.
Stuff. Not yet. We still have a question. School for the Gifted here. Um, thanks very much, Charles. That was quite an emotive start to that as well with that connection. Um, I'm just wondering why why is it important to have a solo repertoire for the oboe? The oboe plays a very important role in symphonic repertoire. You, you can't miss the oboe in almost every concert you'll go to where you hear the symphony orchestra. But a lot of the solo repertoire that you will hear is a lot more obscure, particularly from the 19th century on. And uh, a lot of that music can be difficult to access because it will be putting, displaying the technical proficiency before the actual musical message. And it is not only important for oboists to have the opportunity to, to use this instrument, it has, it has phenomenal potential for, for communicating and telling these stories, but it's important for audiences to be able to connect with this instrument in, in all of its potential. I'm not only including the oboe, the oboe is actually a family of instruments, there, there's also a bass oboe, an oboe d'amour and a cor anglais. We hardly ever get to hear these instruments and I think that it's important for these instruments to be heard and it's through the stories that that's going to happen. Thank you so much. So our fourth presenter from the Faculty of Science Erin Fagan Jeffries. Taxonomy is the science of species discovery, of giving names and a formal description to living things. It's the science of using similarities and differences in physical appearance or genetics to classify and understand the life around us. Part of my PhD is on the taxonomy of a group of parasitoid wasps. These wasps are parasites of caterpillars. The females use a long needle-like appendage to inject their eggs into the unsuspecting living caterpillar. The baby wasps hatch out inside the flesh of the caterpillar and slowly start to eat it alive. They get bigger and bigger and bigger, eventually bursting out of the caterpillar and turning into adult wasps. It might sound gruesome, but these wasps are really important for controlling caterpillar populations and can even be used in crops to help control pests. I would like to tell you the story of the very first new species of my PhD. This story actually starts 25 years ago when a group of scientists embarked on an exciting expedition to the central highlands of Queensland. They were there to collect something remarkable. Koala poo! They were there studying the insect damage to the koala poo. So they collected a whole bunch of poo pellets, put it in containers, and waited to see what came out. Sure enough, a whole bunch of insects emerged, which they tried to identify, although most were undescribed species, and then placed them in museum collections, where they sat, mostly forgotten, until now. I would like to introduce you to Coerus koala scatacola, literally the koala poo inhabitant. <laughs> I got to name a wasp that lives inside a caterpillar that lives inside koala poo. Definitely a life goal achieved. <laughs> it can be difficult to explain the importance of taxonomy, particularly when you work on insects. But over half the insects in the world are undescribed. These are animals vital for pollination as decomposers, as food sources for reptiles and birds, or as potential control agents for pests and crops. We don't even have names for these animals, let alone know how to tell them apart or what role they're playing in the ecosystem. Our world is changing at an unprecedented rate. And part of being able to predict and prepare for how the environment might change and how we will need to change and adapt with it is knowing what's already here. I'm describing new species of wasp because every piece of information we learn about the environment now is another piece of information we have to better protect it, conserve it, and utilize it in the future. Thank you for a great presentation. Um, you said at the start that uh, species are characterized or differentiated on the basis of form, genetics, and so on. What's most important and what's uh, more accurate or the truth? 
Uh, I think generally as taxonomists we try and use all lines of evidence, so combining everything together. But we have an issue these days in that specialist taxonomists, people who are specialists in one tiny group of wasps or one sort of frogs are, are dying out and we don't have enough taxonomists to be able to really be able to tell the difference looking at physically what the animal looks like. Um, so these days I think genetics and the DNA and how different that DNA is is just going to be used much more widely because more people can do it. You don't need the specialist skills. So it's going to happen a lot more often. Please thank Aaron. So we're halfway there. Our fifth presenter from the Faculty of Health and Medical Science is Rong Hu. One size fits all has been promoted for decades. For a necklace, it might work, but look at your shoes. They all have different sizes and widths because we can't all wear the same shoes. Similarly, in medication, there are many occasions that one dose fits all doesn't work because like the different shoe size, not everyone needs the same amount for every medicine. Perhaps most of you are familiar with the prescription of one tablet three times per day. But for some others, probably they need double or half the amount to achieve the desired effect. The best example is my research on tequolimers. Two people per week in South Australia will receive kidney transplantation. After this surgery, most of them will receive tequolimus therapy to maintain the transplanted organ in their body. However, some patients need higher dose, some others need lower. Insufficient dosing will cause kidney rejection, while overdosing will lead to toxicity. Tailoring the dose for each patient is the best way to balance the benefits and the risks. But how? For your shoes, I should know your size in advance, but for your dose, what should I know? My project is trying to give an answer based on the patient's genetic information. We are all enormously genetically varied. Look at the different colors of our hair and eyes. So the differences in the genes can also cause the differences in medication dose. I have examined the two genes which are responsible for tequolimus levels in our body and found two genetic factors that together explain 30% of the dose differences between patients. One in five South Australian patients will need at least two times of the normal one size fits all dose of tequolimus to keep the transplanted kidney working for them. Although my findings haven't been applied to clinical practice yet, we can force this use in the future from bench to bed that before the surgery, the patients can take a gene test to say if they need an average dose or a higher dose, thus to reduce the risk of kidney rejection or toxicity. And this will definitely benefit those patients and save healthcare budget in the long term. And I will go on to discover new factors to make the prediction more accurate and make it applicable to more patients. Thanks. A question. Uh, you said you focused on two genes. Um, yes. Why those two particular genes? And um, are there others, do you think, that may be important as well? Okay. So I'm not sure how many of you guys got some knowledge in medical science. So when you take the pills and you take it, and it's in the spirit, but actually um, the pill is going to be um, catalyzed, uh, metabolized by the liver enzyme and going to excrete out by the urine. So the two genes, they are responsible for uh, the tequolimus metabolism and excretion. So that's why I'm looking, I just focused uh, at this stage on the two genes here. And definitely in the future, I'm going to look at some 
regulators because the genes, they won't work long. So there are some, we call it the upstream regulators. Probably they're going to affect the, you know, the function of the enzyme's um, ability to metabolize um, those um, pills. But I hope I could make the prediction more perfect because currently it could only explain 30% of the differences as I mentioned. And it seems only one fifth of the population going to benefit the most. I wish I could make it better and make it um, to all, uh, probably to all of the patients. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our six contestants from the Faculty of the Professions is Lulu Oyang. Ten years ago, when I worked for a multinational company, we tried to explain our sustainability policy to our local supplier, but they were confused with the concept. From then, I started to think how to facilitate a shift towards corporate sustainability from a local context. My research is to explore the dynamics of a shift towards corporate sustainability in China. I invite you to think with me. What corporate sustainability means to you? Is it about green? Is it about the opposite side of unsustainability? According to system thinking theory, it is a whole of social, environmental and economic components. Just like this picture, every component integrated together and become part of the circle. But this is not always easy to communicate to local managers and companies. So I ask whether local managers have developed their sustainability awareness and whether there is the chance to facilitate the shift from inside out. China is the second largest economy in the world and has 30 years unprecedented economic growth, which is attracting attention. So this research is not only important to China, but may also prompt some thinking for other countries. To answer my questions, I conducted in-depth interviews, tried to capture small details and subtleties. After interviewing from middle to senior managers, from uh, traditional industries to new IT starters, the preliminary research finding indicated that managers, they are doing good, they're able to see doing good with the long-term growth. However, they rarely connect it to the sustainability itself. It can be the wisdom of passing resources to the next generation in agriculture. It can be in heritage and preservation in tourist industry. They are doing good without conceptualizing it. The next stage of my research is to explore the length of managerial perception, decision-making of organizations in terms of corporate sustainability, and perhaps traditional wisdom. Just like this very special land design, it represents the most indigenous understanding of sustainability, practices for hundreds of years. And I believe it is embedded in every culture. And we should recognize that this can be expressed differently by different communities and individuals. This is why this research is important, not only to China, but we may, we may think it further for other industries, other countries, thinking from local. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so when we think of sustainability, we think about environmental sustainability primarily. What, what are the other more, what's the most underrated or underutilised aspect of sustainability? Yeah. Thank you for your question. So when we think about sustainability, we're firstly talking about environmental. So this um, causes some trade of thinking. So people would think if, so for some companies, for example, they would think if I do, do good to the environment, or I lost part of my profit, do I need to trade off this, um, this with um, doing, maybe I need to reduce cost for the social doing good to the society. So I think the, the part that has been minimizing is that you need to consider sustainability as a whole, including environmental, social, and economic. It is not trade-off. It is that you are able to achieve 
without giving up parts of it. So then the mindset changed, it may cause the future can be changed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So our seventh presenter from the Faculty of Engineering, Computer and Mathematical Sciences, John James. When was the last time you saw a robot win Wimbledon? It never happened, of course, not only because we don't really need robots that can play tennis, but we wouldn't know how to make one anyway. Most people can't play tennis at the highest level, but most of us can do things like run and catch a ball. Even children can do that with a little bit of practice. It's so easy for us to follow the ball with our eyes, we can overlook what a complicated task it is. So what's going on inside our brains that makes us so great? We simply don't know, but how can we find this out? We can try looking inside the brain, but looking inside the human brain is a difficult thing to do. It's big, it's perhaps the single most complicated thing we know of, and its owner isn't going to want us messing around in there. <laughs> Luckily, it's not just humans who have remarkable vision. Insects, such as dragonflies, do as well. Dragonflies are tremendous predators. They're able to catch up to 97% of the prey they pursue, and they're able to do this with a tiny brain, roughly the size of a grain of rice, and with eyes much blurrier than the original iPhone camera. It's going to be far easier for us to understand how the dragonfly's brain works rather than our own. In our lab, we look at how individual neurons in the dragonfly's brain respond to images. In a way, we can read the dragonfly's mind one part at a time. While this is amazing, it still doesn't give us a full understanding of how the brain works. Imagine that you're in a gallery full of dot paintings and you're only being shown a single dot at a time and you're never sure which painting that dot belongs to. That's a little bit like looking at the brain one neuron at a time. It's going to be quite a while before we figure out what all the paintings are. My job is to develop computer models to help us to understand the bigger picture. I take the discoveries that we've made along the way and see how they work together using simulations. In this way, I can see how the brain might respond to different situations and what the different parts of the brain are doing. I can then take what I've learned and test it on a robot which can roam around chasing things the way that a dragonfly would. Doing these things allows us to better understand how the dragonfly's brain works and that in turn allows us to better understand our own brains. If we can understand that, then in time we can have better and more effective robots and maybe one day even build prosthetics to replace damaged parts of the brain. That may seem a long way off now, but we are moving towards it one dot at a time. Thank you. Why did you choose this area of research? Well, it's an area that's been ongoing for a while. It was described to me um, as, you know, we're looking into dragonflies' brains, we're trying to figure out what it's doing, and then we're managing to replicate it through models. And that was just a fascinating topic to me from the outset. Um, I've always had a keen interest in how our minds work. And this, even though it's just a dragonfly, is really as close as I can get for the time being. Yeah. Good question. <laughs> Thank you, John. Our eighth contestant from the Faculty of Arts is Bi Ching Lee. Many barriers exist in this world. Look at the wall of your backyard, the Great Wall of China, and the wall that Trump intended to build between the US and Mexico. Some walls are visible, some are not. There is one such invisible administrative wall in China called Hukou system. You will face this wall since birth. Hukou tells you where you are supposed to stay. Leaving that area often means giving up health care, education, and social security. Yet, 263 million of rural migrants jumped across that wall to live in more developed urban areas. That is 10 times the population of Australia. Just like many people in Australia want to go to Melbourne or Sydney, 
about 60% of those migrants want to go to mega cities. And just like Sydney and Melbourne, mega cities in China are also suffering from big city problems, having headaches with traffic, pollution, and resource constraints. Therefore, the government of China wants to drive rural migrants away from mega cities by building a higher wall, by making it harder for rural migrants to stay. My research, on the other hand, has focused on making it easier for rural migrants to stay in small cities, by making small cities more attractive, by tearing down this administrative wall. After six months of fieldwork in one mega city with a population of 20 million and a small city with a population of 0.2 million, I am now able to answer this question in two steps. First, what do rural migrants want? when choosing a destination. Research, my, my, uh, sorry. my research shows social welfare, infrastructure, living close to family and friends, personal development, as well as job opportunities and good wage are the main things that rural migrants seek. It is not hard to notice. Those qualities does not necessarily add up to mega cities. If those qualities can be introduced to small cities, we might have a solution. Second, what do, what do small cities lack comparing to mega cities? Interviews show social welfare, infrastructure, personal development chances as main aspects need to be improved. Instead of censoring migrants and build a higher wall, my research shows it's possible to solve this problem by changing the cities. If this can be achieved, we might finally be able to put an end to the story of that wall. Thank you. Oh, thank you. That was, that was great. Thank um, you. Imagine you're a decision maker in China then. What would be, if you had the power to make a decision to, to apply your research in some way, what would be the first thing you would be looking to do? Yes. Um, actually, the whole coal system has been in China for a long time. And this system was built because China at that time, don't have the uh, energy to bring all the social welfare to all of the people. But now China is growing and have all those uh, energy to do that. But what, why is not China doing that? That's the question you're asking and if I'm the policy maker. It's because this system have built up a, an unequal system, making the inequalities to grow up. And now if we just tear down this wall immediately, everybody would be in Beijing and Shanghai. So what I would do now is to deal with inequalities first. So like I said, we need to make small cities developed as much, if not as much, but better, like as the mega cities. So then we can tear down this wall and we will be fine. That's what I will do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So our ninth presenter, a finalist from the Faculty of Science, Gemma Sifang. There are two types of jobs if you're a pig in the pig industry. You can be the bacon or you can make the bacon. In order to make the pork industry sustainable and efficient, we need to pick the right pig for the right job at the right time and we don't always get this right. I work with the girls who make the bacon in the breeding herd. To get a job interview with me, you will have to be a pig, and you're gonna need a uterus. That's literally it. Who I hire from there is pretty much random, and not all girls are cut out for this line of work. You're gonna have to get pregnant young and often, which some girls are great at, but other girls just can't perform. If you can't perform in this job, you'll end up sent to market late. It's not good for the pig, and it's not good for the pork industry. In my PhD, we wanted to know why girls who have similar genetics and the same living conditions could end up with two different outcomes in the same job, and how we can improve this hiring process. I'm now going to tell you the story of the two girls on the screen. So these girls, their mums are pregnant at the same time, and so they share everything, a birthday, a home, and they got jobs together in the breeding herd. One of them ended up employee of the month but the other girl ended up dead. So how come only one girl was able to excel in her field? Let's go back to the beginning. 
Not to the day they were born, but to a time just after they were a twinkle in their father's eye, during their fetal development. The girl at the top came from a litter of mainly males. So when she was developing, she was exposed to really high levels of stinky testosterone. So she was masculinized. Whereas the other girl came from a litter of mainly females. When it comes time for work after puberty, the girl at the top comes strolling in late if she bothers coming in at all. Her productivity is as low as her circulating estrogen, and she is not doing anything or anyone. <laughs> Whereas the girl at the bottom, she comes in early. Her hormones are skyrocketing, and she is getting it done. She's giving 16 and pregnant a run for their money. So when it comes time for their performance review at the end, which is actually just a pregnancy test, the girl down the bottom got herself knocked up. Great job. Whereas the girl at the top, she didn't even get pregnant. That's literally all she had to do. That is her full-time job. All she's given us is attitude, so it's off to the abattoir and off with her head. She's way past her prime, so we can't even use her for bacon. All we're going to get out of her is a few sneaky snags. And this has been my PhD. We started at the end with two very different types of females and worked out that females from a male bias litter are masculinized and therefore they have lower hormones around ovulation and are less suited to the breeding herd. This means that my new hiring regime is going to be all about girl power, hiring females from female bias litters into the breeding herd. Thank you. Thank you. Great presentation. And very engaging. Um, is there any free bacon, by the way? No. <laughs> so how much bias does there have to be in order to exclude a female? And what percentage of the herd would exhibit that extent of bias? And That's so a great how much question. a difference can it make? Yeah. So we started looking at a 70% bias, so 70% males as our male biased, because this is what was found in other litter bearing species. Um, to cause a difference, but when we actually conducted the research, we found 60% was enough um, to cause a difference. That being said, in a normal um, herd, you'd probably get around 60% of your breeding females will have a 50-50 litter, and that other 40% will be somewhere between 60% male biased or 60% female biased. Um, but when it gets to about 90% bias, not many animals are having um, a skew that high, but 60% is, is fairly common. Thank you, Jenna. So our last presenter from the Faculty of the Professions, Jenna Norman. The Greeks had democracy. Rome, empire. The great work of our time is to make a big shift from people destroying the planet to people helping the planet to flourish. My research is about the role the law can play in this great work. You might think I'm studying environmental law, but I'm not. I want all of law to take the earth into greater account. One of the main ways the law takes something into account is to make it a legal subject. I want to make the earth a legal subject. Not the whole thing like some sort of giant corporation. And not piece by piece by giving rights to parts of nature. I want the law to take the earth into greater account by taking greater account of the earthling in each of us. The conventional legal subject is the rational, autonomous individual. It's kind of a, a mind without a body and totally out of context. Actual human beings, we have bodies and we're bound to the earth. And for us, context is everything. I propose a legal subject called the cosmic person. Why cosmic? It's all about context. Cosmic is the context of the universe. The universe imposes three governing imperatives, interdependency, connectedness, and emergence. Nothing is or can become anything without everything else. Everything counts. Cosmic is the context of the planet. The Earth is a closed system. This implies limits. 
the law has to stop being about the individual life project and start being about the project of life itself. Ecology counts. Cosmic is the context of the person. Being a person involves relationship and affect and embodiment. We live, we love, we grow. Experience, not abstraction, counts. The rational, autonomous individual is hardly accountable to anything or anybody else. But the cosmic person is accountable to everything and everybody else because it's a part of the whole community of life on the planet. The law needs the cosmic person to bring it down to Earth. That was great. That was so, a, a really interesting topic. How did you, what, what spurred you on to, uh, to ask these sorts of re uh, research questions there? Well, I'm very interested in the way the legal subject or how we think about human beings when they're involved in the law. I'm interested in the way that that defines the moral community more broadly. What happens in law both reflects and um, sets out what happens in the broader culture. And so I thought if we could think differently about human beings and bring that into the law, maybe that opens up possibilities um, to work on the major issue of our day, which is the human-earth relationship. I think you'd agree, 10 fantastic presentations. Can we please thank our presenters once more? So now it's the time to vote. It's the people's choice and our students' choice. So a reminder, uh, you should now have your ballots and a pen. Please raise your hand if you don't have a ballot. We'll get one to you. So colleagues will now do so. Using the ballot paper, place against the selected box your favourite presenter. There's one down here we need as well. Uh, Remember the judging criteria, which is up on the screen. And when you've had a time to reflect, uh, we will send the volunteers to collect your ballot paper, probably along the aisles. Now, we'll have a short break while the judges take and deliber do their deliberation. Then we'll tally the choices and the students' choices. Colleagues and friends, we've reached that moment. The results have been received and I'd like to invite all the contestants to the stage, if you would, to, to the floor. We'd first like to congratulate all our finalists. I'd like to invite the Vice-Chancellor to award them with a gift uh, as I call out each one of their names. So, Danielle. So, Mike, you might stand on this side, it's pretty easy. So, give them a round of Danielle. Yep. Lauren. Charles. Aaron. Wrong. Lulu. John. Beijing. Gemma. And Jana. It's now time for the students' choice. And I'd like to invite the principal of Unley High, and perhaps one of the students. There's, there's a big check here, so, you know, it's one of those ones where <laughs> there's no chance you'll ever cash this one, I tell you. Uh, so I'll hand over to the Vice-Chancellor, and the winner of the students' choice is... The winner is John James.
Now over to the People's Choice, and the winner is Mike. The winner of the People's Choice Award is Gemma Seifeng. Now for the big one, and clearly the judges spent a bit of time on this, so it was not an easy choice. The 2017 three-minute thesis winner is... Can I have a drum roll, please, drum roll, John? Drum roll. drum roll. The 2017 winner is Gemma Seifang. Hey. So colleagues and friends, congratulations not just to the winners but to all the students who presented tonight. It's wonderful to see that the future of science and research is in such great hands. Um, they, they did all a fantastic job as you'd all be. Please once again thank our winners tonight. I'd uh, especially like to thank Emily High for their presence here, our inaugurals, thank you. And don't forget, Research Tuesday resumes as normal next month, so please check out the Research Tuesday website for more information. Thank you and good night.